I welcome you to the eighth session of the IPCI's Comparative Religion course. And we are on part six of Christianity. It's going to be our last session on Christianity. And perhaps we are going to be discussing the crux of the difference between us and the Christians. And that is going to be salvation and the crucifixion. So an overview of today's session. So we're going to start off today's session. We're going to try and understand what exactly is the Christian uh, belief on salvation. We're going to put it into perspective. Then we're going to present the Islamic view so that we're clear on the Islamic view. Because certain nitty gritties when it comes to the Islamic view, many of us may not be aware of ourselves when it comes to hukukullah, hukukul ibad, forgiveness of tawbah, these sorts of things. Sometimes we need to be aware what is the is exact Islamic ruling on this when we are discussing with a Christian. Then we're going to analyze the evidence for the Christian view logically. We're going to analyze it historically. We're going to an analyze it scripturally. And then we're going to look at common Christian objections. That Christians often make objections against the Islamic view of salvation. So they may say things like, well, how can you be so sure that your own actions ten, can take you to heaven? Doesn't someone need to die? So we need to be able to respond to these objections easily with quotes from the Bible and with quotes from the Quran as well. Then we're going to go on a, uh, to a very interesting topic and that is the, the topic of the crucifixion. And we're going to see how many, many Christians and even secular historians have claimed that the, the crucifixion itself, the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross, they have claimed that historically it cannot be Christians. It's something that 100% is historically proved. So we're going to go through the quotes of various historians from the first century and the second century and really we'll analyze for ourselves how strong is the case for the crucifixion outside of the Bible. So we can understand the Quranic implications of the verse وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ which is a verse uh, which a lot of discussion is going about especially in today's times, new interpretations, new ways of looking at this verse, things perhaps we haven't even thought of because for us generally when we hear وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ they did not kill him nor do they crucify him. We have only understood it in one way. But as we'll see in today's session, people are trying to give different interpretations to this and we're going to weigh out these different interpretations and see whether they hold any weight or not and see what the classical scholars have had to say about this verse. So when we talk about salvation or another word they use is soteriology, what exactly are we talking about? So we need to understand that first. We're discussing salvation in Islam and Christianity. Well, what does that mean? That means... In Islam and in Christianity, what do you need to do as an individual? What do you need to believe as an individual for you to be saved in the next life? So that's what we're discussing here. That from a Christian perspective, from an Islamic perspective, what do you need to believe? What do you need to do to be saved in the next world and to be saved from punishment and to get into heaven? So this is an extremely important topic. As you can see, it's discussing our entire future as human beings, where we're going to end up in the next world. So we need to make sure, and this is a point when we're discussing this with Christians, to emphasize the importance of this topic. That if you've understood the topic of salvation wrong, then your very salvation in the next world is in jeopardy. Now, for Christians, when it comes to salvation, they focus a lot on this. So, so you, you know, to get into Christianity, many times it seems like you just need to believe that Jesus died for your sins and then you've already attained salvation. So this understanding of what is salvation, what is the crucifixion, all of this here is very, very vital to Christianity. So their basic belief, and it differs a little bit amongst the sects, is that all humans are naturally sinners. And you know, we, as Islamically, technically, there's nothing wrong with this belief in and of itself. That we know as human beings, we have been created weak, we do generally sin. But then they have a, another belief which they put in, and this is what's going to be contested basically throughout this discussion, is they say the wages of sin is death. 
Now this is a quote that's often used that if a person sins, there has to be death or someone has to die. So that means that since mankind, everyone's a sinner here, someone had to die for the sins of mankind. So what happened was, and I'm just stating what's the orthodox Christian view, that there's a triune Godhead, this the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. The Son took the form of Jesus Christ, took on a human nature, and He sacrificed Himself and He died. So now once He died, the rest of mankind is now freed from their sins, and they can engage with God as they should be, and they can now ask for forgiveness whenever they commit sins. But someone has to die. That's the, basically the crux of the Christian belief is that there can never be forgiveness unless someone dies. And we're going to discuss what are their proofs for this. But already you can see where the problem is going to go with this. The problem is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the rules. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supreme. The creator is supreme. He doesn't have any laws that he needs to follow. That if, if he needs to forgive, someone needs to die or something needs to happen. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supreme. So the crux of our discussion here is going to be this. There's we are going to claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supreme and He makes the rules. And they are so to say going to claim that no, there is a rule that someone has to die and then only sins can be forgiven. So they believe that through His death and resurrection, mankind can now be reunited with God. And further than this, they also believe that His death cancelled the law of Musa salam, the Mosaic law. They believe that that was abrogated with the death, death of Christ and now salvation is gained by believing in his death and resurrection and not in good works. So originally in the Jewish law, you had to believe, but you also had to follow the law. You had to do amal, you had to follow the Sharia. Now Jesus died. Why did he die? He died because uh, someone had to die for your sins. And now with his death, we're just stating their perspective. With his death, the law is cancelled. So now you just need to believe that he died for you and everything's good, everything's fine. So that's basically their perspective. We're going to analyze it just now, historically, logically, scripturally, but just understand what they are saying now. We're trying to state it in the most clear terms, unbiased terms for now, just to make sure that we're not misrepresenting them. Because sometimes uh, a key block in your discussion is when you misrepresent the opponent's view. So we're just trying to understand exactly what they are saying. Now the Islamic understanding, and of course this is something we know, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us لِيَعْبُدُونَ So that we can worship Him and some Mufassirin have explained so that we can recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for this purpose لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ وَعَمَلًا So that He can test us which one of us is best indeed. And He sent messengers for this purpose. The purpose of the messenger is solely to connect you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to show you what's the best way to live. For, for a person to gain salvation in Islam, he needs to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And why? There's a, there's a very logical component to this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you. He gave you everything. He's your creator. Morally, it's binding that if anyone does good to you, you have to recognize this goodness. And no one has done more good to you than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, than the creator. Therefore, you have to recognize the goodness he has done. You have to recognize that he created you. You have to worship him. All of these things follow logically. Now, why I'm stating this is because this logic will follow even in the Christian worldview from Adam to the other prophets. And then when it comes to Jesus, everything is changed on its head. Now, you no longer have to recognize that God created you. That's not the focus. The focus now is you have to believe that someone died for your sins. So this is where when you see everything going right, it's straight, everything's fitting. And then one blip there, you understand where something went wrong. So that's why I'm trying to emphasize from the beginning how things worked in a very smooth, flowing, logical manner. So we believe in Islam, and this was the belief of all the prophets from the beginning, that if you, if you understand, if you recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you do all the amal you need to do, you follow the sharia, you will gain salvation. Yes, as a, as a person you will err, you will commit sins, we all commit sins. And when that happens, you make tawbah for your sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you. If it so happened that, you know what, a person believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he did major sins. And now he didn't repent from those sins. It is possible that he can go into Jahannam, he can go into hell for a little while, and then he will come out. So the Islamic worldview is very clear. Once a person says, Man qala la ilaha illallah, dakhar al jannah. Whoever says la ilaha illallah believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is going to be in Jannah forever and ever and ever. There's no question about that. You have attained salvation. But at the same time, Amal, the Sharia, following the law of God, also has a very high place in Islam. And therefore, if you wrong someone, if you kill someone, if you do major sins, if you hurt people, and you don't ask them for forgiveness, you don't ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgiveness, it is possible that you will have to go into Jahannam for a little while. Allah protect us from that. 
So understanding the Islamic worldview is once you have recognized God, you will get your eternity in paradise, but you need to then make sure that you're doing the right deeds, you're doing good to people so that you completely escape and you completely remain free from going to hell. So that's the basic Islamic worldview. And the proofs from this are littered throughout the Quran, so to speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ فَلَهُمْ جَنَّاتُ الْمَأْوَى نُزُلًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ That as for those who believe and do righteous deeds, then they will have a, a, a heaven, you know, a place to, uh, to reside an abode of, of paradise forever and ever as a recompense or as a welcome for the good deeds that they have done. And on, in contrast to that, those who disbelieve, they will be in Jahannam forever and ever and ever. And the hadith then explains to us that that person who believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but was a sinner his entire life, he will have to go to Jahannam for a little while and eventually because of his iman, he will be taken out. So when a person, and this is maybe something for us to understand because we are in a comparative religion course, that when you read the Quran, only the ayat of the Quran, the Quran only talks about two categories of people. Those who did good deeds, and they believed and they will be in Jannah forever. And the kuffar who did bad deeds and they were kuffar, they will be in Jahannam forever. The, the Quran itself doesn't discuss the topic of a believer who's a sinner. It doesn't discuss his hukam, going into Jannah and then coming out. That comes from a hadith which are mutawatir, which have reached the status of such a level that it's mass transmission, that they, it's on, in, in terms of transmission we have to accept it. So that, is, that, that law is discussed in the hadith. So important to remember that. Then when it comes to forgiveness in Islam, we're going to discuss about hukukul ibad. If I happen to wrong someone, let's say I hit someone, I hurt someone, and he went away and I never got a chance to ask him for forgiveness, and I ask Allah for forgiveness, what will happen in that case? Because we need to know that also, what will be the ruling in that case? Do I, does that person have to forgive me on the day of Qiyamah? Will he take my good deeds? So all of that is coming up later. But a basic understanding of what we have to believe is that you could very well um, you know, if, if, if you have wronged someone, you could, as a believer, end up in Jahannam and then come out to go to Jannah.